Yeah, so we were dealing with hierarchy of convergence concepts. So we said convergence almost surely and convergence in the arc mean implies convergence in probability and that convergence in probability con implies convergence in distribution right and between these two we know that if the, uh, the converse is not true, but if the limit is a constant then they are equivalent right. Uh, here we gave a counter example, we proved this last class, we proved a major theorem about the equivalence of almost sure convergence and excursions beyond m right and using that we proved almost sure convergence in place convergence in probability. We have also given a counter example that the converse is not true right and this, this direction we proved using Markov inequality and uh, the converse you can, I do not know the converse to a given example. Uh, if not, uh, we, we, we will find an example soon. Okay, and so I think what remains is I have to give counter examples in that neither of these are implied, right? So the almost sure does not imply mean square convergence, and mean square convergence does not imply almost sure convergence, right? So to see that, so if you want to, so if x n converges to x almost surely does not imply convergence in let us say mean square, in order to see this it is actually we have already seen this example. So, you have let us say the 0 1 interval as your sample space and let x n of omega be, so x n of omega is equal to uh, n from omega n 0 comma 1 over n equal to 0 otherwise right. So, remember this example. So, in this case your, so in this case we do have convergence almost surely right x n tends to 0 almost surely right because as n tends to infinity for uh, for every omega you have in fact this is uh, the way I have defined it I think it is sure convergence actually for every omega in the sample space you have uh, x n of omega going to 0 right and in this case of course, so what is expected x n squared hmm? expectation of x n squared is Can you not compute from here? Hmm? N square times one over n plus zero, right? <coughs> right. So limit n tending to infinity, expectation of x n minus zero, the whole square is infinity right. So, the mean square goes to infinity whereas, the random variable goes to 0 almost surely right. So, with very small probability the random variable takes very large values correct. So, although the random variable is tending to 0 almost surely you have a situation where the mean square is infinity going to infinity the mean goes to 1 right that we have already seen ok. And in order to, so that is the counter example to show this is not true, right. And in order to show that, uh, so if you want to show x n tending to x uh, in the mean square does not imply Here again you have seen an example already. So, you take x n equal to 1 
with probability 1 over n equal to 0 with probability 1 minus 1 over n and x n independent. All the x i's are independent. Okay. So, in this case uh, you have already shown that x n does not tend to x almost surely. Remember? How did we show it? Borel Cantelli lemma, right. So, in this case, it is very easy to show, on the other hand, that x n approaches 0 in the mean square, right. Correct. Because what is expected x n squared? It is 1 times 1 over n. So, expected x n square goes to 0. So, you do have mean square convergence and you do not have almost your convergence. Okay. So, that way you have also disproved that. Okay. So, between these two there is no relationship. Right. One may hold the other may not hold neither. Right. So, you cannot say any uh, implication between them. Any questions? Okay, so now what we will do is uh, from so there are a few other convergence results which I will state without proof. Okay, they are useful in what we are going to study about law of large numbers and so on. The proof is as, uh, proofs in some cases may be somewhat long and technical. So, I am just going to state the theorems so that you are aware of the results okay. and you can always consult uh, more advanced textbooks if you want to read the proof. So, here is a theorem. If x n converges to x in probability, then there exists a deterministic subsequence, increasing subsequence. n 1 n 2 dot 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 such that x n i converges to x almost surely as i tends to infinity. Okay. So, this is a nice uh, result to know. In fact, it is going to help us uh, later when we prove uh, strong law of large numbers. So, this result says, so you know the following, right? you know that convergence almost surely always implies convergence in probability, but the converse is not true. right? So, here for example, in this example, we have convergence in probability, but not convergence almost surely. Right? With me? So, the, the difference is essentially that convergence in probability only demands that epsilon excursion at n must have vanishingly small probability, whereas convergence almost surely demands that epsilon excursions n and beyond must have vanishingly small probability. Correct. Now, what this theorem is saying is like a partial converse to this. We know that this implication is not true, this implication is not true, but what this theorem is saying that some partial converse is true in the sense that if x n approaches x, say x n converges to x in probability, it may not be true that x n converges to x almost surely, but there may be some subsequence which converges almost surely. Okay. So, 
So, I think so I the best way to explain this is to just give a give an example ok. In fact, the example is going to be this ok this guy. So, our favorite example right. So, I, this is not a proof ok it is only an example right to make my point. Uh, so, again you take x n is equal to 1 with probability 1 over n equal to 0 with probability 1 minus 1 over n x n are independent. Here what was the problem? So, here x n was converging to 0 in probability right. So, the probability of x n itself being uh, being 1 is very small right it is like 1 over n, but because this Borel cantilever lemma 2 says that no matter how far out you go there will be some 1 popping off somewhere right. So, you do not have the you do not have the statement that beyond n you are always guaranteed to be within epsilon that is not true right. So, I drew a picture. So, no matter how so let us say this is your n right. So, the probability of x n being 1 is very small right, but no matter how big n is there may be one occasional 1 that pops off here right. No matter how far you go right there will be with probability 1 some 1 that is popping off right because Borel cantilever lemma 2 says that. Now, what this theorem is saying if you subsample right the subsequence is sim simply sampling your uh, under like this not looking at all indices it is looking at certain sampling of these indices. It is saying that you can sample in such a way that you will avoid these occasional ones popping off ok. Is that clear? So, no matter how far out you go it is true that there will be the occasional one popping off but you can find a subsequence such that you can avoid those ones because they are rare enough ok. So, this is a and this these subsequence that the ones the ends that you select are can be chosen in a deterministic way it does not depend on omega ok. By deterministic I mean it does not remain depend on the particular realization omega. <coughs> For example, in this case how would you do it? There, can you think of a sampling? Can you well? Can you think of a subsequence for which the convergence to zero is almost surely true? Hmm? So if you take, so suppose you do this, right? Suppose you take n i equal to i squared. Okay, that's my subsequence. So, I am instead of so and I am considering the sequence <coughs> not x 1, x 2 so on I am considering x 1, x 4, x 9, x 16 and so on ok fine. So, I am not looking at all ends I am looking at 1, 4, 9, 16 that subsequence. So, now what is the probability that let let n i equal to i squared now probability that x n i equal to 1 is what sorry 1 over i squared correct. So, what do you have now? So, Borel cantilever lemma 1 will imply that x n i converges to 0 almost surely correct. So, if you look at x 1, x 2, x 3 and so on no matter for how far out you go you are guaranteed to find some 1 popping off, but now you are looking at rare enough instance instances right you are looking at 1, 4, 9, 16 you are going very quickly right. So, this this subsequence ends up avoiding all the ones eventually ok this is not a proof again this is just an example. And this is always true whenever you have x n converging to x in probability there is always some subsequence it may not be 1 over i square it may not be i squared, but it is some other subsequence, but deterministic subsequence such that x n i converges to x almost sure ok this is clear. Deterministic subsequence. Ah, so, as, as I said a deterministic subsequence. So, what I mean is that 
the n i right the n i that he choose does not depend on omega. I square or I no, the, the, that is not, but there is a deterministic relationship. So, he, in this case, for example, Ni was I squared, right? It is a deterministic relationship. It does not depend on my realization of what the xn's are, it does not depend on omega in any way. It may not be I squared in particular, it may be something else, but it is a deterministic relationship, okay? It can be chosen irrespective of omega, that is what this deterministic means. <coughs> Actually, you can it does not have to be i squared, it can be i power 1 plus delta, and that would be enough, right? What I was asking is, can I take the sequence like 1, 2, 10, 15? You have, yeah, I mean, yeah, so you have to uh, figure out whether it is this convergence holds, but there always exists some subsequence. Whether you manage to find it, whether your favorite subsequence holds or not is, is, is a different story. Here, in this particular case, I do not have to have 1, 4, 9, I can have. Uh, I to the 1 plus delta or something like that, right. So, I just need Borel Cantelli lemma, the summation to be finite, and I am done, right. So, if you look at rare enough indices, you are going to end up missing all the occasional, there are very few ones by the way, right, but they do occur no matter how far out you go. But if you slightly under sample these indices, you end up missing all of them eventually, right. So, this is good to know, this theorem is very useful, it is going to help us in strong law of large numbers, okay. Actually, it is going to help us in going from weak law of large numbers to strong law of large numbers, okay. Okay, there is another theorem again, which is, uh, which I will state, this is called Scorocord's theorem, Scorocord's representation theorem. Let x n n greater than or equal to one and x be random variables on omega f p such that <coughs> x n converges to x in distribution. Then, there exists a probability space omega prime f prime p prime and random variables y n and y on this omega f omega prime p prime <coughs> such that y n <coughs> have the same distribution as x n and y the same distribution as
as x and y n converges to y almost surely. Okay. So, this says that, so you know that almost sure, almost sure convergence is strong convergence, right? it is a very strong notion of convergence, it is stronger than in probability which is stronger than convergence in distribution. Now, this Korokot representation theorem says suppose you have convergence in distribution, it does not imply any other form of convergence necessarily, but it says that if you have convergence in distribution, you can find a sequence of random variables in another probability space which has the same distribution as your initial sequence, but now the convergence in the new space is almost surely. Okay. So, actually this is a constructive proof you can actually uh, if I remember correctly uh, you can actually take, take this omega prime f prime p prime as your 0 1 interval 0 1 interval. Uh, Borel and Lebesgue. Okay, so you can, in particular, explicitly construct a sequence such that uh, you are you have uh, you can construct a sequence y n which has the same distribution as x n and y which has the same distribution as x. But in the new probability space, which may have nothing to do with this, you will have convergence almost surely. Okay, these two spaces can be very different. This may be a space of coin tosses or something. This may be, for example, this may be real line or 0 1 interval, okay. but the distribution will be CDFs will be the same and the convergence will be almost sure. Okay. And the proof is constructive, you can explicitly construct such a sequence. This is again a useful uh, theorem to invoke in a few places, okay. it comes in handy in, uh, in a few places. When you are not really bothered about so, it comes in handy when you are not really bothered about the specific probability spaces, but you are instead concerned only about the distributions. Okay. Uh, for example, the next theorem I am going to state is going to use this okay. uh, or the theorem after this perhaps. So, if x n converges to x in distribution and g is continuous, ha, okay. so g is continuous then g of x n converges to g of x in distribution. Ah. Ah, yeah, so, here we will use Korokot theorem. So, we are saying that if g is a continuous function, so if x n converges to x in distribution then g of x n converges to g of x for continuous function g. Okay. See the way to prove it is as follows, actually you will agree with me that if x n converges to x almost surely and g is continuous, you will agree with me that g of x n converges to g of x almost surely, why is that true? Hmm? It is actually from continuity, right. I mean after all if you have a sequence x n converging to x, g of x n will converge to g of x for a continuous function. Now, it is not it is not everywhere it is just almost sure convergence let us say on a set of probability 1 right. So, you just have to prove that on a set of probability 1 g of x n converges to g of x except this theorem is not talking about almost sure convergence it is talking about convergence in the distribution. So, you use Korokot to make the connection. Okay. So, the proof is as follows.
So there exists uh, y n converging to y almost see by mean by see by writing there exists y n converging to y almost surely I mean in that sense right they have the same distribution they may be in a different probability space okay since y n may live in a completely different probability space from x n. So, I n converges to y almost surely. Next, since g is continuous, so for all, so the set of all, so this y is live in see this y is live in omega prime f prime p prime right. So, the set of all omegas in omega prime for which uh, g y n converges to g y is at least as big as the set of all omegas in omega prime for which y n converge to y. So, do you agree with the statement? So, okay, these y n s converging to y happens almost surely and these y n s live in some other probability space that is by Skoro called right. Now, I am saying that since g is a continuous function the set of all omegas in this new probability space omega prime where this convergence happens is at least as big as the set of omegas where this convergence happens agreed. Why? That is nothing but continuity. See, for every so suppose an omega here is such that this convergence happens y n of omega converges to y of omega. Then for that omega, this convergence is guaranteed. So, any omega here is necessarily an element of this set, correct. So, this containment is clear and it follows only from continuity, you do not there is nothing sophisticated here. So, you agree with this right. So, that is almost sure convergence right. This is almost sure convergence. Inside the next here huh? no this is just convergence in the set of this is convergence. So, actually what I should write is in order to make things perfectly clear I should write and similarly here right the set of all omegas where y n of omega converges to y of omega this is just convergence in the sense of sequences right and similarly here I would return it as like a random variable, but you should put an omega everywhere right. You agree with this containment, but what is the probability of this set? Hmm? 1 right therefore, the probability of that set must be greater than or equal to 1 and therefore, must be equal to 1 right. So, which means so this implies so this set will have probability greater than or equal to 1 right. So, which means g of y n converges to g of y almost surely correct this implies g of y n converges to g of y in distribution because convergence almost surely certainly implies convergence in distribution. But on the other hand uh, see you know that y n and x n have the same distribution. So, if you put a continuous transformation g on it g of y n will have the same distribution as g of x n and g of y will have the same distribution as g of x right. So, this statement would imply that g of x n converges to g of x in distribution ok is the proof clear and so this will imply uh, so this will imply the result 
this implies the result again because of uh, because square chord says this y n and x n have the same distribution right. Any questions? So, this is called continuous mapping theorem. Okay. So, convergence is convergence in distribution is preserved under continuous maps. Okay. <coughs> so, this is then finally, this is a very important theorem on convergence in distribution. This is theorem, well, this is so this is chapter 7 Grimet and Sturzaker theorem 19. Okay. I will prove one direction and leave it. Okay. So, the theorem says if x n converges to x n distribution, okay, sorry. So, x n converges to x n distribution if and only if for every bounded continuous function g <coughs> we have expected g x n converging to expected g x okay So, this is an important theorem. It says that x n converging to x is equivalent to saying that for every bounded continuous function g of x n converges to g of x. Okay. So, there are two theorems to prove here. Okay. So, one is that if you have convergence in distribution then no matter. So, then you pick any bounded continuous function then you have this expected g x n converges to expected g x. So, what is the sense of this convergence? The research is numbers. Okay. So, this is expectation this is some number this is some number this is some sequence converging to some number. Okay. <coughs> so, the proof the easy part is proving this direction. Okay. The more challenging part is proving the converse. Okay. So, I will just prove one direction. Okay. Converse requires more, more work. <coughs> Proof only if. Okay. Proof of only if. Which means I am going to assume this. So, what shall I say? So, if x n converges to x in distribution. then g x n converges to g x n distribution correct. Agreed? Why? Please continuous mapping theorem correct. So, now I have to invoke score a chord right I have to invoke score a chord actually you know what. So, I can invoke score a chord and get to here right. So, actually I do not even need to go this far. Uh, so, what I really need is to get here g y n converges to g y as in the previous theorem. Okay. Then actually I need 
g y n converging to g y in what sense almost surely and these y's are y n's are like in score record okay this is by score record. <coughs> these y n's live in some different probability space not in the same as x n. Uh, now, so now what happens? Ah, now since G is bounded expected G of Y n converges Why, right? Why is that true? Dominated convergence theorem, correct? But y n and y n and y x n have the same distribution, and y y n x have the same distribution, right? So this implies expected g x n converges to expected g x. Okay, so that one direction is easy. It's just Koro chord followed by followed by application of uh, DCT, right? The converse is more complicated. Okay, I will not spend uh, class time on that. It's not. It's not enormously difficult. It's just long. Okay. So the reason this theorem is important is because in more complicated spaces. Uh, this is this, so. This is taken as the definition of weak convergence. Okay, so these xn's are just real valued random variables, right? So you can define convergence and distribution in terms of convergence of CDFs, right? But in more advanced probability, these xn's may take values in some Hilbert space or some complicated spaces. It may not just be real valued or Rn valued even. It may have take values in like some Polish space or something. In the case, you cannot talk about the convergence of the CDFs. In that case, you only talk about this. So you take this as the definition of weak convergence. Okay, that's why this theorem is important. Great. Then. Okay, so I will state two theorems about. No, so I have to state two theorems about convergence of characteristics functions. Okay, so the first theorem is going to say that if x n converges to x n distribution, then x n the characteristics functions converge. Okay, and finally, I'm going to say if the characteristic functions converge, does it imply that the distributions converge? Not always, but more or less. Okay, so those are the two things I will state. theorem if x n converges to x n distribution then c x n of t converges to c x of t for all t. Okay. So, convergence in distribution definitely implies convergence of characteristic functions. So, in some sense uh, if you want to in the hierarchy of convergence you can put convergence in distribution implies convergence of characteristic functions c x f t for all t right. Now, how does this follow? See x n converges to x n distribution. So, um, proof x n converges to x n distribution. So, y n converges to y almost surely by score record right then y n have y n and x n have the same distribution y n x have the same distribution ok fine. 
then you can show that uh, this is excellent then y n converges to y almost surely. So, this implies um, cos y n t converges to cos y t almost surely correct for all t and similarly for sin right. right both for all t. So, which means I can take now this cos is a bounded function sin is a bounded function. So, I can invoke dominated convergence theorem and say that expected cos y n t goes to expected cos y t. So, this implies so and then you can take I over this plus i that right. So, I have expected cos y n t plus i sin i times expected sin y n t converging to uh, this expected sin y t expected sin y t for all t. Right, this is because of by d c t and so that is your characteristic function of y n right. So, this means that c y n of t converges to c y of t for all t, but c y n of t is equal to see x n of t because they have the same distribution. See after all the characteristic function only depends on the marginal C d f of y n's and x n's respectively right correct understood. So, this is why in this Kolokar theorem is very useful right because it helps you to go to a, a new space where you can invoke all these d c t and m c t and so on and then come back to the space you want. Okay. This proof clear? Fine. I think I am out of time. Uh, uh, so, maybe I will just state the next theorem and explain it in the next class. Okay. Let C x and T converge to a valid characteristic function C x of T. Then x n converges to x in distribution. Okay. So, this is like a converse to what we said there right. So, there we said if you have convergence in distribution you are guaranteed that the sequence of characteristic functions will converge. Now, here so I mean I have not stated it really properly. So, but you are saying here that the limit of your sequence of characteristic functions is another valid characteristic function then you have convergence in distribution. Okay. The problem is sometimes you may have a sequence of characteristic functions whose limit function may not even satisfy the properties you know those 
non negative kernels and equicontinuity uh, uniform continuity and all that right. So, those probability may not be satisfied by the limit function in which case there is no question of the limit function even being a characteristic function right. But if that problem is not there if the limit is in fact a characteristic function then you have convergence in distribution ok. So, it is not a full converse in some sense it is a converse with a caveat ok we will take it uh, tomorrow.